praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we lift our hands to the Lord today and let's begin by entering into his presence. Would you begin to lift your voice unto the Lord? Surely the Lord is in this place, that this is his house and this is we are his people the sheep of his pasture lord god i give you praise i give you worship i give you adoration i give you thanksgiving because you are our god and i pray today that your presence would establish you oh god in our hearts I pray today that your presence would fill this house, oh God. I pray, God, you would minister. Would you lift up your voice because the Spirit of the Lord is in this house. Lift up your voice unto the Lord and bless him. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I magnify you, oh God. I love you, God, and I come to you tonight, God. God, you are the rock of our salvation. You are our strong tower, our rock of defense. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. In the name of Jesus, I give you praise. Let's enter into worship tonight in Jesus' name. Check. 
judges cleft for me. Hallelujah. Let me hide myself. Indeed. Oh, what a great song. I'm so thankful for his presence. And I know that we worship, but I want to encourage you, if we could do that again, would you lift your hands and just thank God for his goodness that he expresses to us on a Wednesday night that we can go to the rock of our salvation. Amen. The stone the builders rejected, but yet, oh, he is our friend. When the earth all around is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. And I appreciate the faithfulness of God. I am so thankful to see each and every one of you in church on a Wednesday night. And I honor the work of God in you. And I believe God's going to talk to us tonight. How many of you believe God's going to talk to us? Amen. Amen. Before we get to that portion, would you turn and just go shake somebody's hand and tell them, I'm so glad to see you in church tonight. Amen. Would you greet somebody around you? What a joy to see you in the house of God. What a privilege to fellowship with you. I love you. I bless you in Jesus' name. Thank God for his people. Hallelujah. Thank God for the goodness of the Lord. Praise God. And as you return to your seat, if you're finished, you may be seated. Thank you for being in God's house tonight. May the Lord strengthen you according to his goodness. I want to encourage you, every one of us, that we would intentionally invite somebody to Resurrection Sunday on this, this coming Sunday. Amen. A lot of people call it Easter, but I'm just telling you, don't come to church by yourself if you can help it. Let's invite somebody. We have Next Level Breakfast. It's happening at 9 a.m., our kids' special service will begin at 9.30. Main service at 10.45. Hebrews Men's Fellowship will be happening on this coming Tuesday. I know I jumped there. Let me back up real quick. I, I jumped real quick. So everybody say Easter Sunday. So we're going to do next level breakfast at 9. The kids' service will begin at 9.30. Main service 10.45. I am encouraging this great church to be here at breakfast. Let's fellowship together. Let's enjoy each other's company, eat some breakfast, talk to brand new people. Don't just talk to the people that you know. Venture out, meet somebody brand new. If you think they're brand new, go up to them and meet them. They may tell you they've been coming to Parkway for two years. That is actually, that's okay if that happens. Just say, well, I didn't know. I'm glad to meet you. Praise God. And then... After Resurrection Sunday, and I believe it's going to be a good time, on the first Tuesday of April, we're having April the 2nd, Men's Fellowship at Fleetway, where we're going to drink coffee and we're going to talk about the Word of God. And then our annual harvest training will be happening on Saturday, April the 6th. Coffee and donuts will be served. And uh, you're going to be learning about altar working, and you're going to be learning about how to teach a Bible study. My encouragement to every one of you is to please be here if you have a passion to reach souls. It won't be all day, but it will be enough to give you understanding and inject into you a desire to be a soul winner. Also, Polt's Parents' Brunch will be April the 13th. And this is at 10 a.m., so all parents of youth, please plan to attend this time and get to know Brother Caleb and Sister Adina Beebe, and we're going to discuss the 2024 Student Ministries vision. Food will be provided, so if you've got a young person, please make plans to be at this. Also, Ladies' Night Out is happening April the 20th at 6 p.m. Registration is on the Parkway app. Can somebody say there's lots happening? There is a lot happening, and I am thankful. Our goal is to minister to not just the individual, but as much as possible the entire family. And I'm so thankful that Kids Church is happening across the hallway tonight with Brother Jason and Sister Gina, and our youth are meeting back in the student center. So there is quite a bit happening on a Wednesday night, and to God be the glory. Somebody say amen. Amen. I want Bishop to come. He's going to take our offering, lead us in our decree. God bless it. God. Anybody excited about being in church tonight? Hallelujah. Hey, there's nothing more enjoyable than coming and feeling the presence of the Lord. But I'll tell you what, I had an epiphany. It's almost like I heard the doorbell ring. Get the picture now. 
You run to the door and it opens and Publishing Clearinghouse is standing there with a big banner that said, you have won one million dollars. How many of you would get excited about that? Amen. How many of you would hit your feet and said, oh yeah, that's me. Come on now. Well, Amen. hallelujah to God. That's it, Brother Drake. Praise Sister Drake beat you up, I think. Praise God, because she, she was all excited. Amen. And many of the, amen, many of you. And I'm going to just tell you this. I don't think maybe the doorbell will ring, but I do know one thing, that if you give, something greater than publishing clearinghouse is coming. And there's blessings coming to your household. Amen. Beyond measure, shake, shaken down, pressed together, and running over. How many loves those running over blessings? Amen. 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 You know, I don't like a little of anything. If you're going to have watermelon, we're going to cut a big one. <laughs> Praise God. If you're going to have ice cream, amen. Brother Creole, I like a, a big bucket of it, all right? But, you know, God doesn't operate on little. God operates on overflowing blessings. Right. And how many of you want to be a part of the overflowing blessing crowd? Come on, somebody. Thank God. Thank God. We're fixing to dip the bluebell. Praise God. Vanilla is just going to be running away. I'm just, hey, it's going to be greater than that. It's the blessings of God that make you rich, and they add no sorrow. Thank you, Lord, for those blessings. And right now, I pray the blessings of God. As a bishop of this church, I pray the blessings of God upon this people. Lord, we've come a long way. It's been a journey. We've gone through lack and we've gone through blessings. But God, at the end result, we have been blessed beyond measure here at Parkway Church. And Father, I pray the blessings of heaven upon every one of those who bless the kingdom of God in your giving. And Father, I thank you. You're going you're gonna to multiply it, not addition. There's going to be multiplication coming in Jesus. How many receives that? Throw your hands up and let's just... They then throw our hands up and receive that multiplicating blessings coming to your life. Praise God. Because he said, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given to me. Press down, shake it together, and running over. I'm a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not room enough to even receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs job, raises and bonuses, sales and commission, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and return, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, my whole family saved and walking with God, perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. Well, I am blessed going in. I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You can text to give by Parkway Church. Amen. I'm, amen. Let's, let's give as we, as we choose to give, but let's make sure we give in Jesus' name.
Can you give God another hand clap of praise and thank God that we are getting ready to leave this world. And we're headed to a city on Mount Zion. Though a pilgrim, yet I love thee still. You know, a lot of those old songs are powerful because they are filled with the doctrine. They are filled with the word. And I'm not disparaging Amen. The new, I love both the old and the new, but there is, there is time that sometimes we just need to go back and let's sing them old songs. I like them old songs. Praise God. I like the new, but I like the old. Hallelujah. Praise God. And you may be seated. I want to just kind of talk to you tonight. I want to encourage you first and foremost. Amen. Make sure you invite somebody to Resurrection Sunday. And I need every ministry team leader available to meet guests and mingle with people at our Sunday breakfast at 9 o'clock. Also, I need every available altar worker to help me work with new people in the altar. Our greeters will be welcoming people at 1030, connecting also with them after church in our welcome center. And here, I want to say this again. You've heard Brother Kerry talk about it. But he says, if you bring someone, please don't take them out of the church before we have a chance to connect with them. And we do that in our guest reception area. So when I tell you that uh, Sunday is an important day, and obviously that we know every Sunday should be important, every time we connect, with each other and with God should be important. In our culture, in our world, sometimes people are only going to darken the doors of a church on Christmas and Easter. So we want to take, amen, every available opportunity to make it the best that they've ever been a part of so that when crisis comes to their life, they'll remember, I know where a church is where I can feel God and I can find God and they'll come here and we'll get to baptize them in the waters of baptism in Jesus name somebody say praise God amen in your Bible and you may stand for honoring the word of God Exodus 12 verse 12 and uh, I am so thankful to communicate tonight with you the word of God because it is powerful and in our world today there is a great ignorance of the word of God there is literally uh, the Bible says that there's going to be a famine not of food or drink so if you like to eat comfort yourself God's word tells us that there will always be some food somewhere but there will be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord and so I want to communicate that Exodus 12 God says for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Everybody say, pass over. You and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I want to just talk to you tonight, teach, preach, however God expresses through me on the pattern and the power of Passover. I know that's a lot of peas, but just, amen, eat your peas and carrots tonight. The power and, amen, the pattern and the power of Passover. Look at somebody and just say that to them or just kind of mouth it if you can. The pattern and the power of Passover. Amen. Would you put your Bibles down? Let's clap our hands to the Lord and you may be seated. Amen. In the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. I am excited about just the good that God is doing. The Easter season is upon us, though I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. So many in our culture refer to it as Easter, so I pick and choose how to approach that. This particular season is so important to us as Christians and celebrated by a host of different people because of the hope that springs from the resurrection. And I'm going to be preaching about it on Sunday 
Sunday, and let me just pause to tell this great congregation, when I am preaching or any preacher's preaching in this pulpit, the Word of God, it's not just that you should get excited about it because it is God's Word, but I'm hearing, amen, Bishop always tells us it's not going to jump from the pulpit to the pew. It's got to first go through you. So whenever a preacher is preaching, you get excited. Why? It first has application in your life. But secondly, there's going to be somebody around you that says, well, if they're excited about it, I think I need to be excited about it. If they're going to the altar, maybe I need to go to the altar as well. So just, amen, just uh, know this, that I'm thankful that you are a responsive church. And when we come to Sunday, amen, we're, we're not going to let the presence of guests, amen, make us be intimidated. We're going to have church, and you're going to preach with me. Can I get a hand clap if you're going to preach with me on Sunday? Amen. This past Sunday is known in Christian history as Palm Sunday, and the day is recognized as the Sunday preceding Christ's passion when he entered into Jerusalem riding upon a donkey. This act was symbolic of a conquering king, and the Jews covered his path with palm fronds, which represented victory over the ruling oppressors. The Romans, Jews in Christ's time, were under the government of the Romans, but they were actively looking and praying for a Messiah or a conquering ruler to come and deliver them from every outside government. This is why the disciples asked Jesus in Acts 1-6, will you at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put into his own power. But but here is the, the crux of the matter. They were looking from their Messiah to recover the glory days of King David. They wanted the preeminence. They wanted the prominence of nationhood to be revered and respected by nations around them. But Jesus was coming to deliver them from a, an enslavement called sin. The Jews believed so strongly against enslavement to anything when Paul said in Romans that he would not be brought under the power of anything, he said it from a historical perspective. Romans were never enslaved, nor did they have a slave mentality. Jewish families taught their children fervently and strongly that they should never be enslaved to any person or thing. This is why when Israel would backslide, becoming captives to heathen nations was the strongest punishment God could give them. This action was a slight against their national identity. It was God saying, I'm going to give you exactly what you don't like because you're giving me what I don't like. You're disobeying my word, so I'm going to give you over to be a captive of a heathen nation. If you notice, the Jews have always retained their national identity no matter where they went, they are more convinced than we are that they are the head and not the tail. So you'll hear a Jew say, I'm an American Jew, or I'm a Russian Jew, but they always maintain their Jewish identity. Where did Israel get the pretense for the action and the ideology that they should not be enslaved? In your Bibles, the book of Exodus lays the groundwork and the framework for a lasting principle that has prevailed in Jewish minds. God told Moses while he was in the wilderness tending Jethro's sheep, he said, I have heard the cry of my people, and Moses, you will be the one to go and deliver my people out of Egyptian bondage. They are enslaved, and they need a, a deliverer. So Exodus 3, 8, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up 
out of that land unto a good land and a large, a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hiv Hivites, and the Jebusites. So here is the understanding. God loves his people and does not want them to be enslaved. And so God raises up for his physical people a deliverer by the name of Moses. Now Moses, in, toward the end of Deuteronomy, he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses from among you, from your countrymen, your brothers or brethren, you shall listen to him. This was a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus Christ that would be raised up from among the Jews who would become the deliverer to deliver people from sin. And I'm telling you, it just never gets old when you consider that Jesus is our deliverer and he delivers us from the power of sin and death amen can the church say amen? amen Jesus is like Moses in many ways Moses was both the prophet and a lawgiver and Jesus is too Jesus was widely recognized as a prophet who spoke the word of God and he gave commandments for his followers to obey both Moses and Jesus mediated a covenant between God and men. Moses the old, Jesus the new. Both Moses and Jesus were born during perilous times and both narrowly escaped a king bent on murdering babies. Both Moses and Jesus had a connection to Egypt. Moses was the adopted son of a king, and Jesus is the son of the Most High. Moses spent 40 years as a shepherd, and Jesus is the good shepherd. Both Moses and Jesus were known for their meekness. Moses and Jesus are alike in that they both led God's people out of captivity. With great power, Moses led the Israelites out out of physical bondage and slavery and Jesus with even greater power let, led God's people out of spiritual bondage and slavery to sin. Can we clap our hands and give God praise for that? Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Jesus proclaimed freedom for the captives and set the oppressed free. Hallelujah. Moses was like Jesus in that he performed miracles. Not all prophets did. Several of the miracles of Moses bear a resemblance to Jesus, most notably providing bread in a wilderness area. Jesus did this when he fed the 5,000. In fact, after Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes, the people's thoughts ran immediately to Moses' prophecy. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet that would come into the world. When you begin to see the interweaving of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how God puts it all together, it is powerful. Can the church say amen? Another way that Moses was like Jesus is that he held intimate conversations with God. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Jesus also had a special relationship to God. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to he who the Son reveals him. When Moses stood in God's presence, his face shone with a heavenly glory, had to be covered with a veil. And this reminds us of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when his face shone like the sun. And I'm, I'm going to give you just a couple more points here, but another important way that Moses was like Jesus is that he constantly interceded for the people. God said, let me alone. I'm going to kill them. And Moses said, listen, this is, this is not what you need to be known for, that you delivered your people to kill them. He said, I'll start over with you. And Moses said, no, you blot me out of your book, but you take care of your people, for they are precious. Woo! 
when the Israelites sinned, Moses was always standing by ready to petition God on their behalf and plead for their forgiveness. After the blatant idolatry at the foot of Mount Sinai involving the golden calf, Moses interceded twice for the people and his intercession was needed at other times. His intercession, Moses' intercession was temporary, but our Lord's is everlasting, for Scripture tells us if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God interceding for us. The Bible says he always lives to intercede for us. So can you imagine Jesus is interceding between God and us on our behalf? Don't, don't kill him, God. Give him another chance. Aren't you thankful that God gives us another chance? He gives us another day. His mercies are new every morning, and you'll wake up in the morning, and God willing, the sun will be shining. And I'm telling you something about the dawn of a new day that brings literal hope. A man, not only was Moses an intercessor for God's people, but like Jesus, he was willing to die for them. He offered his own life in exchange for sinners. And the Bible says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus proved his love when he laid down his life for you and I. Finally, Moses and Jesus were alike in that both were sent to people who, by and in large, rejected them and would not listen. Moses led a continuously rebellious people. Numerous times people tested God and rebelled against Moses. Like, likewise, Jesus was sent to a people who did not receive him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them, to them gave he power to become. Ladies and gentlemen, when we receive the word of Jesus, it gives us the power to overcome and to become who God intends us to be. Can you clap your hands unto the Lord and give him praise for his goodness? Moses was on the backside of the desert and was tending his father-in-law's sheep. Amen. That's another similarity in that he was in charge of someone else's possession. He was in charge of his father-in-law's possession. Jesus is in charge of, amen, the eternal God. We know that he is God, but as a man, he understood, I'm here on behalf of what is important to the Spirit of God. So when you understand that, it, you can see that similarity. God proved that he, was, that he was God unto Moses by having Moses throw down his rod, and it became a snake. And right about that time, I would have pulled out a shotgun. And I'd have said, I'm going to take up a serpent. Pow! Watch him leap up into the air. And then God said, now pick it back up. God, we need to talk. <laughs> it can't be you. <laughs> Cannot. And then he said to Moses, put your hand inside of your clothes. And when he brought it out, it was leprous. And when he put it back in and brought it out, it was clean. God was proving to Moses that I am with you and I will allow my spirit to go with you to accomplish miraculous signs that are not to give you affirmation that are not to make you look good. Well, bless God, I can throw my staff down. No, no, no. It is to prove that God is with you. Let me just pause to just say this, and I, I know that you don't need for me to say this as a great church, but when God works the miraculous in our midst, it's not for us or for our self-esteem or look at what we've done. It is look at what God did, and he can do it for anybody that will believe on him. Moses confronted Pharaoh and tells him, let my people or God's people go. And so 
Pharaoh pushes back, and in the pushback, God shows Pharaoh that he can push harder. And he begins pretty lightly by turning the water of the Nile River to blood for seven days, and, and the fish died, and it stank. And can you just imagine everywhere you turn on the water, what you expect to come out. If you were at your house, and you turned on the water faucet, and out ran sticky, drippy blood... That is just plain nasty. Can the church say, you're right? And so God turned all the water sources to blood to essentially get there. He sent them on a, uh, uh, not just a water only fast, a nothing to drink kind of fast. Then the frogs inundated the Egyptian land by the multitudes. And then when Moses, uh, our Pharaoh petitioned Moses, he, Moses said, when do you want the frogs to leave? And, and uh, Pharaoh said, uh, tomorrow. You know, it's amazing that when God deals with us and when we can repent immediately, we tend to linger in our horrid condition waiting on tomorrow. You don't need to wait on tomorrow. You need to say, get them gone right now. Amen. Not tomorrow. There was a song that came out, One More Night with the Frogs. Moses tossed dust into the air and it became a great invading swarm of gnats. Now let me just tell you and be plain with you, I, I love to get out in the woods, especially in the springtime, and when there's been copious amounts of water, as it has been, I think it rained three inches just uh, a day ago, the gnats begin to come up. They breed in that water. And it's almost like no amount of bug spray you put on will, will cause them to deter. And they get into your eyes and up your nose and in your mouth. Can you imagine millions upon millions of gnats and they're everywhere. I'm going to tell you right now, it's enough. Just the few hundred that surround me is enough to drive me crazy. But can you imagine that God sent gnats to frustrate them? Now, in the first two miracles, the, the, uh, the magicians of Pharaoh did the same. They would turn the water to blood. They, uh, they brought frogs out of the water. If I was Pharaoh, if I was a good Pharaoh, I'd have said, listen, quit doing what he's doing. You're proving you're, as, you're not as good as him. You're just equal to him. I need you to turn it, reverse it. But here's the thing. It was when... It was when Moses came to the dust and he took that dust and, and God began to turn the dust into gnats that the magicians, if you've been reading your Bible and you read this, they say uh, that they essayed to do the same. They tried to do the same, but they couldn't. And they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. You know why it's the finger of God? Because only God can work with dust. Just go ask Adam. It was in this miracle that God left the devil in the dust. God left the devil in the dust. Come on, somebody. That's pretty. And just look at the say, that's pretty cool right there. God left the devil in the dust. And so I'm not going to belabor, but the Egyptian livestock were hit with a devastating plague of illness. Both Egyptian people and animals were hit with a plague of painful boils. Great hail, as had never been seen before, fell from the sky. A plague of locusts swept through the land, destroying the crops not done in by the hail. Darkness came over the land of Egypt for three days. And the Bible says it was a darkness that could be felt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've been in some dark places, but I've never been in darkness that could be felt. But it was a darkness like never before. And the final, the final plague is where we need to look very closely because God is about to not only bring judgment, he's about to reveal a pattern that has power to deliver when you understand it in its context. Amen. Would you look at a neighbor and say, you got to get this. If you're sitting close to somebody, you got to get this. The last judgment is the firstborn child of both man and beast was killed throughout the land. We're talking about the firstborn of the cats in the litter or the dog in the litter or the cow the firstborn of man and beast die. This last plague is the one that finds lasting significance and becomes a biblical principle 
for our deliverance as well as Israel's. It concerns the plans of God for destruction of all firstborn in Egypt. God said all the firstborn will die from the Pharaoh on the throne to the man in the dungeon to the cows in the field to the dog on the porch. Israel's only salvation was to obey the instructions God had given to Moses. And here's the reality. If you want to avoid God's wrath, you must obey God's word. If you want to avoid God's wrath, you must obey God's word. There is no other solution. The solution to avoid this destruction has its origin in God's atonement for Adam and Eve. Because when Adam and Eve sinned and they went and hid, the, the Bible says God comes looking and now they had taken fig leaves and sewed them together and covered themselves, but they still confessed we're naked. We know we've attempted, but we're, we're insufficient. And so God says, where are you? Well, Adam said, we hid because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? The end result, the, the four curses. But in that, God takes animal skins from an innocent animal. Now listen, just pause. You may hear this again on Sunday. Are you okay with hearing it more than once? Do you know what it said? That you need to hear something about 24 times before you really get it. So the truth is, don't just say, well, I've heard that before. You need to hear it again and again because this pertains to your personal salvation. God took innocent animals. He stripped the skin off of the innocent animals and wrapped those bloody coats around Adam and Eve. And the Bible says they were clothed. I just paused because I saw a husband and a wife conversing, amen, and I thought about that. You need to hear something 24 times before you actually remember it, and I think about my own relationship with my precious wife. Sometimes I need to hear something over and over again. Take your shoes off. Put your clothes up. Can a husband say amen? Anybody in the same boat I'm in? Praise God. Let's, let's fellowship, all the fellas in the same ship. Amen. Glory. And so Exodus chapter 12, Moses gives the plan. I'm going to kind of read through this. I may skip over some of it. The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Notice Israel's New Year celebration wraps itself around their deliverance from Egypt. And guess what? Anytime somebody is born again because of the plan God laid out, it's a new year to them. It's a brand new year. It's a brand new start. Woo! I feel good about that in the Holy Ghost. God, give us some brand new years starting for somebody. Amen. Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take them every man. Everybody say, every man. A lamb, according to the house of their father, a lamb for a house. And I could pause right there and tell you that the lamb, it's not just personal, but the lamb is supposed to affect your house. Your entire house should be impacted by the lamb. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house... <laughs> Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. In other words, you don't need to just let the lamb affect your house. You need to let it be shared with your neighbor. Won't somebody just look at somebody else and say, you need to share the lamb. You need to share the lamb. Why? Because the lamb tastes good. Anybody ever had lamb before? Lamb is, a, now you may not like it, but my Lord, I'll eat your share. It's amazing, but it serves a purpose in this instance. And so your lamb, verse 5, shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, there's no mistaking, Christ died on the 14th. 
Amen. The lamb died, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it, and you shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall you eat it. Do not eat it raw and neither boil it with water. But roast it with fire, his head with his legs and with all the pertinence thereof, and you shall let nothing of it remain till the morning. And that which remains, what you could not eat, amen, you burn it with fire, and here's how you're going to eat it. Eat it with your clothes on and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in a hurry. That means eat it fast. It is the Lord's Passover. Here's verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will, everybody say, pass over. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I used to, as a young boy, I used to see the word, the Passover, and I would think, boy, you know, I know it's a Jewish feast day, a Jewish celebration, but literally the Passover is the moment or the night that God said he moved into Egypt and every house where there was no blood, the firstborn from dog to, to husband to wife died if there was no blood. But when he came to the house where there was blood, he passed over that house. Why? Because something innocent had already died for the guilty people inside. Woo, isn't that powerful? Something innocent had already died for the guilty people inside the house. Amen. And, and he goes on to say, This day shall be to you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. Whoever eats leavened bread from the first day till the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. In the seventh day there shall be another holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done done in them say that which every man must eat that only may be done of you and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for in the self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt notice God did not say in the self same day I brought your slaves out of the land of Egypt because God understood I'm not speaking to you about your past I'm speaking to you about your future I'm telling you that you are a part of the armies of the Lord and what I'll do in you and through you will be great and they will be amazing things to bring about my plan Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah. God said to Moses, the deliverer, he said, I am going to use you, Moses, to preach to those people to bring them up. Everybody say up, out, and into. When people repent, literally, when you offload the burden of sin, you immediately feel an elevation. Why? You feel a lifting because the burden of sin is not weighing you down. I've heard people say, when I repented, I felt a lifting. A, a burden was released. But that is not the finality of it. You're still in the land of Egypt. You've got to leave Egypt or do an exodus, a departure. And when you go through the, the waters of the Red Sea, see that is uh, up out so you you go out of Egypt and God brings you out of that land but if you just wander in the wilderness that's no good either you need to go everybody say in two and so that's receiving the Holy Ghost, which is the promise that the Father has said he will give us whenever we repent and are baptized in Jesus' name. When you begin to see this, it is amazing to understand that the Old Testament preaches in typology what we get to experience in actuality. 
Praise God. This is so powerful because it sets us apart, not for pride and not for arrogancy. But when people think about joining this church, it's not just saying, well, I'm a member at Parkway. You join this church by a new birth experience. This is why sometimes, uh, amen, even as a pastor, I see church parking lots filled, and I see people online, and the, the sanctuaries filled with people. And in my spirit, I get a little jealous because I'm like, God, why can't we have that at Parkway? And we do, I know, and it's happening. But many times, just coming to church and just kind of showing up and there's no real accountability to that new birth message. Boy, that's an easy thing. I can show up and soothe my conscience but no change or no coming out of Egypt is required. But because God has allowed us to be a Holy Ghost filled church, a Jesus named church, we're going to preach it in love. But when they come we're going to say, thank God you're here. Now let's get you out of Egypt. Let's get you out of out of slavery. Let's get you out of bondage. Come on, would you clap your hands? That's what Sunday's going to be about. We want somebody to leave Egypt while they're in our midst. Woo! I'm almost done. Jewish tradition regarding the Passover, the moral and religious obligation of every Jew is to feel as though they were the one that was delivered. They may not have been the actual one that was delivered. The whole feeling of liberation is meant to carry on from person to person. I remember when I had breakfast with the consulate general down in Jackson. He was passing through. I can't remember all the, uh, the ways it came together. But sitting at that table, he said, every person is supposed to experience a leaving of Egypt. Every person is to experience that. He said it wasn't just for our nation or our people. It's for everybody. And, I, and in my mind, I don't think I said it out loud. In my mind, I said, sir, you don't know how true that is. Because in our New Testament understanding, Jesus Christ is the Passover. Let me read Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered into once, or entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God so watch let me make it plain in the if I say the old tabernacle Moses would take the ashes of uh, the blood and the ashes of an animal, innocent animal that was, was killed. He would mix it together and he would take a bunch of hyssop and he would sprinkle, whether it was an object or whether it was people, he would sprinkle them with that mixture. And when they got that sprinkled mixture on them, they were considered to be clean. And that was very important because you didn't want to be unclean. And so it then takes us in Hebrews, this chapter, to the New Testament where Christ offered him his own self and by his own blood, he didn't just make us clean in our flesh, but he purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The Old Testament sprinkling was for the purging of the flesh, but the New Testament blood of Jesus is for the purging of the inner man. Amen. The covering and the cleansing of the inner man first. It does affect the outer man, but the Old Testament could only affect the outer man. Christ starts where it really matters on the inside, the inner man. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't this powerful that our God gives to us not only the understanding of this, but the experience of this. We don't just get to understand this, we get to experience it. Woo! I'm talking about it'll make you shout when there ain't no shout music around. 
It'll make you have joy whenever there's nothing else external to bring you joy to know that he has forgiven me. He has cleansed me. He has washed me whiter than snow. It wasn't anything that I did to deserve it, but he did it because he loved me and I was obedient to his word. Hallelujah. I think we need to give God praise right now and glorify God for he is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Would you clap your hands? Would you love Jesus right now? Would somebody say it's more than a story? It's more than just a story. It's a reality. And we get to experience that reality. I want us to stand and I want us to lift our hands and thank God that we're not enslaved by sin any longer. We are not enslaved by the old man of sin any longer. But Jesus Christ has cleansed us and he has cut off the chains of our oppressor. Hallelujah. He has freed us. Hallelujah. I'm opening this altar and I would to God you would come down to this altar to fellowship the spirit of the Lord right now and just begin to tell God thank you for the reality hallelujah thank you for the reality that I get to experience the power of God in my life thank you would you come to this altar and with lifted hands would you lift your hands to the Lord would you just begin to love him Woo, hallelujah hallelujah Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Would you, when you get to this altar, would you pray, God, renew me in the Holy Ghost. God, strengthen, strengthen me, oh God. Fill me with your spirit, God. Hallelujah. That's it. Come on, church. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. 